second talk this morning is uh, Brian Collier, who is uh, going to talk about Nightmare uh, Spaces and Higgs Well, Thanks. Uh, so it's great honor to be here. I'm uh, one of the grandchildren uh, <laughs> later. Um, and yeah, so let me just get started. So uh, the picture uh, is about one of these higher Teichmuller spaces for the group E7. We're not going to talk about the group E7, just as a, just there, uh, as a nice picture. Okay, so let me just start talking about what the objects are. So S for me is going to be a closed oriented surface. This is going to be assumed to be greater than or equal to the top. It's just a topological object. Uh, and G is a real or complex uh, connected simple Lie group, like SLNC or SLNR. Um, right, so the, these assumptions, you know, I can say it's a complex or real or reductive Lie group, and I just have to add a lot more adjectives to all the statements I say. So let me set this, uh, this setting. Uh, and the main object of interest, a uh, thing I'll be telling you about is called the character variety of S. Um, so I'll denote it by XSG, a set of group homomorphisms from the fundamental group of my surface into my Lie group G, considered up to conjugation. Um, uh, there's a technical point where you need to look at some subset, so you've got a Hausdorff quotient, but this is somehow, again, not the, the most important aspect of, for today. And it'll be kind of denoted throughout the talk as XSG. And in case you forget what XSG is, I wrote it on the board over there. This, uh, how you get deep into a talk and you ask, what is X? And uh, I've been using it the whole time. It's not, okay. Um, right, so the questions I wanna uh, talk about today uh, is, well, kind of some basic topological questions. Um, like how many connected components does this space have? Um, and kind of a more vague question of, are there any components which are kind of extra special? Um, so let me tell you more about uh, an answer to this question, which is yes, um, in a specific case. So for the group PSL2R, which the important aspect is that that's the exometer plane, um, Bill Goldman proved that this character variety has 4G minus three components, and two of them are extra special. So two of them consist entirely of representations, group homomorphisms, which are so-called discrete and faithful. So this means the representation is injective and the image is discrete. Okay, and well, these types of objects act properly as continuously on by isometries on the hyperbolic plane. And well, the quotient is your surface back, but equipped with a hyperbolic metric. In fact, in this way, you can realize the Teichmuller space of hyperbolic structures on the surface um, and the one for the conjugate, I mean, change the orientation surface as open and closed subsets of this character. Okay, so these are examples of extra special components. Okay, so great. So what are some results that are known uh, about these component counts? Um, well, there's a topological invariant, which you know, helps you distinguish uh, the components. So namely given a representation, I can build a G bundle, flat G bundle, and um, I can, and G bundles on your uh, topological surface are classified by a characteristic class, um, which you can identify with an element of the fundamental group of G, okay, which is a finite uh, building group because it's uh, simple. Oh, if, if it's complex or compact. Okay, so anyways, so what has been proven um, using uh, kind of in terms of this map? So the first case is when G is compact. So when G is compact, um, uh, Narasimhan and Sashadri in 1965 and for SUN and uh, Ramanathan for general compact groups proved that this map tau is a bijection. Okay, so that means that components of the character variety for compact groups um, are you know, classified by some characteristic class. Um, okay, so they didn't, maybe you know from the names, uh, they proved some theorems about modular spaces of holomorphic bundles and were able to conclude this. Um, so that'll be kind of a theme as we go along. 
Okay, the next result maybe is when G is complex. So when G is complex, uh, Jun Li also proved that this map tau is a bijection. Okay, so every component of this character variety for complex groups is labeled by a topological name. Uh, and of course, for complex groups, um, they're homotopic to their maximal compact subgroup, um, and uh, which is also a simple uh, uh, Lie group, meaning there's no there's no uh, infinite dimensional center. Um, and so what you get to conclude is that so since they're homotopic, their characteristic classes are the same. So what you get to conclude is that every representation into a complex group can be continuously deformed to one which factors through a compact group. Okay, so I want you to think of these <laughs> examples as, well, we know the answer and there aren't any extra interesting components. Okay, so the first uh, example of and the PSL2R case of extra interesting components of the theorem of Hitchin. Um, so from 1991, so they proved that if G is a split real Lie group, so like SLNR is a split real Lie group, um, then there exists a representation uh, into G, uh, which cannot be continuously deformed to one which factors through a complex. Okay, so. Uh, Here's a cartoon of what uh, that previous slide was supposed to capture. Uh, here's the kind of first case where the, here's the character variety for the complex group. Uh, you know, it's not compact. Maybe I just say that's the only thing that's accurate in this picture. Uh, uh, and inside in the little blue thing is a compact part, which is the character variety of the compact group. So every component contains something uh, in the compact group, but um, for PSLNR, um, here are the components uh, for PSLNR. There's ones which do contain representations into the compact group. And Hitchin says there's this other one over here. Um, and this one's actually topologically accurate other than the dimension, tractable. Um, and uh, this is an example of one of those things um, which the titles had one of these higher rank type spaces. Okay, so that's something I'll hopefully explain to you. Um, let me give you the definition of what I mean by a higher rank Teichner space. So you're not guessing uh, when I use the words. Um, for me, I'm just gonna take this as a kind of easy definition that we can work with. <clears throat> so a higher rank Teichner space is going to be by definition, a connected component of this character variety, which consists entirely of discrete and faithful representations. So what Hitchin proved was that this component here doesn't contain any compact representations. So that's a very necessary condition to have discrete and faithful representations, uh, but it's very far from uh, sufficient. Okay, so this doesn't follow automatically from what I told you yet already. Okay. Uh, okay, so the way that I study character varieties and these types of questions are um, using a completely different set of tools, which is maybe closer to um, work of Karen. Um, uh, namely, I use uh, theory of Higgs bundles um, and a correspondence. So let me briefly tell you uh, how Higgs bundles work, and then I'll get into more of what these objects are. So to even talk about the objects, I need to fix more structure on my surface. So right now it's just a topological object. I need to fix, make it into a Riemann surface. And when I do that, I can form some moduli space of holomorphic objects on that Riemann surface called G Higgs bundles. Okay, before I tell you what they are, the kind of way they're connected to the first half is that there's this famous theorem by Hitchin and Donaldson and Simpson and Corlett in various generalities and well, directions of this map. Um, it says that there's a real analytic isomorphism between the character variety, the space I started talking to you about, and this moduli space of Higgs bundles on a Riemann surface. Okay, so in particular, they have the same number of components. Um, and well, the upshot, so the character variety is very easy to define. That's why I can start with it. So, um, the upshot of this is that, well, Higgs bundles are more complicated objects and a moduli space of more complicated objects comes with more uh, structure. And so you have more tools to study the topology of this space. 
Um, let me also say that I don't want you to think of this space as a better space than this space, um, but it's just a different space that has uh, the same topology. Um, even though I think about this space more than that space, but uh, uh, for example, the character variety has a natural symmetry of the mapping class group of the surface. And once I pick this Riemann surface, um, you know, I break that symmetry. Okay, so that's just to tell you this isn't better. Um, okay, let me briefly tell you how this arrow, this, this correspondence goes. Um, and I'll, then I'll tell you more uh, on the next slide. So it works by relating stability conditions um, on Higgs bundles to existence of special Hermitian metrics uh, or metrics on bundles. So um, let me kind of just briefly say that on the Higgs bundle side, um, you have some holomorphic bundle with some extra stuff and you're looking for a Hermitian metric which solves some gauge theoretic equations. Um, and on the other side, so if I start with the representation, I pick a Riemann surface. Um, you can interpret this notion of a metric as an equivariant map to the symmetric space of the group. And what you're looking for is a, uh, such a equivariant map, which is harmonic. Okay, so let me kind of say more details of what this is. So what, what are these Higgs bundles? So for GLNC, Higgs bundle, so this is the kind of first case we'll, we'll deal with. Um, it's just a pair E phi. Um, so Higgs bundles will always be a pair E phi, but what the E and the phi are will be slightly different for different cases. Um, so E is going to be just a rank N holomorphic vector bundle on my, on my Riemann surface of degree zero. And my phi, which is called the Higgs field, let me just, I didn't write that, but I'm going to, surely say it many times, and let me just make it clear now. Um, what is it? Well, it's a section of some bundle you build from E, namely it's the endomorph, you look at an endomorphism of the vector bundle, and I want a one zero form valued in that endomorphism. So it's an endomorphism times DZ locally. Uh, and the condition you want, of course, is that this is a holomorphic uh, object. Okay, and so that's for GLNC. If I replace it by a complex group, I just take the you know, frame bundles. So um, a, for G complex, a Higgs bundle is a pair E phi, um, where PG is a holomorphic principal G bundle, and phi is a holomorphic one zero form valued in the atrium. Um, okay, and there's natural notions of stability, which generalize you know, this slope stability for vector bundles. And uh, you know, using these notions of stability, one can, just, can form a moduli space of semi-stable exponents. And that's somehow the, the object. So let me just be more clear on what the objects were in those equations in the vector bundle case. So this condition of stability, the way the theorem works is that it's equivalent to uh, finding a metric, Hermitian metric on my holomorphic vector bundle, which satisfies this equation. So this is the curvature of the term connection of the metric, plus the commutator of this Higgs field plus a, with its Hermitian atrium. And from such a solution, this connection here with the churn connection plus the Higgs field plus its adjoint is a flat connection, which is holonomy in the complex group G. Okay, so that's how the corresponds. Um, okay, so uh, the beginning though, I told you that for complex groups, uh, there aren't any interesting components. You need to go to real groups to uh, define these well, things I'm going to tell you about. So I have to tell you what a Higgs bundle is for a real group. Okay, and the point of this definition is just, well, when you do this correspondence, you want to get a flat connection, which is holonomy in some real group. Okay, so that's the reason um, the definition, definition is what it is. So if G is real, I'll fix a maximal complex subgroup K, and I'll denote its orthogonal complement in the Lie algebra of G by P. Um, this is the tangent space of the symmetric space. And then, well, to talk about Higgs bundles, I take this stuff for the real group and I complexify it. So let's let KC be the associated complex group and there's therefore a KC invariant splitting of the complexification as KC plus PC. Okay, so here's what a G Higgs bundle is. It's the same type of pair, E and a phi, where E is a holomorphic KC bundle, 
And the Higgs field phi is a holomorphic section of some vector bundle uh, or one form, zero form valued section. Um, and it's in the vector bundle whose fiber is, the, is this PC part. Okay, and again, where does this come from in terms of the correspondence? Um, the way this works, you know, I told you one sided, look, at, look for harmonic maps into the symmetric space. And when you identify all these objects, this Higgs field phi is identified with the one zero part of the derivative of a harmonic map. Okay, this is why holomorphicity of the Higgs field corresponds to harmonicity of this map. Okay, well, the derivative of the map, when I complexify, lands, of course, in the tangent space and the fiber there is P. Okay, so that's why the Higgs field works there. Okay, now the key thing I want you to note here is this makes sense for any real group and compact groups are real groups. So, uh, but when the, comp when the group is compact, of course, it's its own maximal compact, and that means the P term is zero. So that means a Higgs bundle for a compact group is just a holomorphic uh, principal bundle. The structure group is complexification of the group. The point is that this phi term has to be zero. So if I'm going to uh, try to show you, uh, well, tell you about results where um, there are, are components of the character variety which don't contain representations which factor through compacts, I want to say I want to be able to tell you about components of the Higgs bundle modular space where this term phi is never identically zero. Okay, that's the kind of translation. Okay, so let's get more concrete. That was maybe a bit too much lead theory. Um, so what maybe your favorite lead group is SLNR, favorite non-compact lead group is SLNR. Um, so its maximal compact is SON and the Lie algebra decomposes as skew symmetric and symmetric matrices. Okay, and let me skip the principal bundle definition and just go straight to, you know, choose the way SON CX on CN irreducibly to get a vector bundle. So an SLNR Higgs bundle is a tuple, E, Q, and phi, where E is a rank N holomorphic vector bundle equipped with a orthogonal structure. So I'm gonna think of that as a symmetric isomorphism between E and its dual. And I should also assume, I guess, the determinant of this or the trivial bundle. Okay, and now the Higgs field phi is just a holomorphic map uh, bundle map from E to E uh, tends to the holomorphic cotangent bundle, which is symmetric with respect to the orthogonal structure. And of course, is holomorphic. Okay, so those are the objects uh, in terms of vector bundles. Okay, and I've just copied that here. Um, okay, so let's get more concrete. What happens? Uh, yeah. Holomorphic. P is holomorphic, yeah, right down there. That's what I'm going to do. Now. Um, Let's get more concrete. Maybe your favorite leader isn't SLNR, it's SL2 log. <laughs> okay, so when N is two, let me ease the, the notation. I'll denote by K, the holomorphic cotangent bundle of the surface. Um, I want to consider this very special type of Higgs bundle. So the bundle is going to be just a direct, so I'm going to choose a square root of the cotangent bundle. There are two to the two G choices of that. I'm going to choose one. So I'm just going to consider the direct sum of k to the half plus k to the minus a half. This is naturally an orthogonal structure because I take a line bundle plus its dual. And now with respect to this splitting, my Higgs field phi is going to just be the following matrix, 0, 0, 1, 0. So let's just make sure that makes sense. Uh, one, the lower left part is a map from k to the half, the first line bundle, to the second line bundle tensored with k. Okay, so k to the half, k to the half, one is there, the identity is the natural map. Okay, so this is an example of an SL2R Higgs bundle, and it's somehow the most important Higgs bundle that exists in my opinion. Um, and well, let's note also that to this, this is a point, and to this example, I can add a quadratic differential. Um, so I can add a Q, which is a holomorphic section of K squared. And using Riemann Rock, of course, this is. Uh, a complex vector space of dimension 3g minus 3. How am I going to add it? I'm just going to add it to the Higgs field as the coefficient in the upper right corner. Okay, so that's a map from k to the minus a half to k to the half twisted by k, and that's a quadratic. Okay, 
Okay, so remember back at the beginning, Bill Goldman's theorem about the character variety uh, for PSL2R having components that are identified with type image space, something that's a vector space of complex dimension 3G minus 3. And so in kind of Hitchens' original paper where he introduces Higgs bundles, this is one of the things he proves. He proves that under this, this thing I just defined you, we'll think of it as a map from the space of holomorphic quadratic differentials into the moduli space of SL2R Higgs bundles, and he proved that it's injective, open, and closed. And under this tr correspondence translating between Higgs bundles and representations of the fundamental group, this component identifies with a lift uh, to SL2R of type Mueller space. Um, so this is the Higgs bundle kind of description of the representation of the better holonomies of hyperbolic space. Okay. So let me do a quick aside, and hopefully the construction on the previous uh, page will, I, I did it in a way where I recognize it um, in this discussion. So let me do it aside. I'm going to talk about nilpotent elements in a Lie algebra and slices through their work, so-called Slidovi slices. So let me consider a complex, simple Lie algebra, and NG is going to be the set of nilpotent elements from that page. Um, and there's a theorem in Lie theory called the jacobson morozov theorem, which says that every non-zero nilpotent can be completed to a triple F, H, and E, which spans a subalgebra that is an SL2 subalgebra. Okay, so those are the bracket relations. And from this nilpotent and a way of, and a choice of completing it, um, defines for you a slice through the G orbit of your nilpotent. This is called the Slidovi slice. Okay, so given a nilpotent completed to an SL2, and I'm going to look at the following uh, space, SF, I'm gonna take my nilpotent F and I'm gonna to add to it uh, everything in this vector space VE, which is the kernel of add E. Okay, so in terms of SL2 representation theory, you know, you have an SL2 subalgebra, it lets you think of your Lie algebra as an SL2C module, and this V is just the set of highest weight spaces. Okay, so I'm going to take my slice to be F plus everything in the highest weight space. Okay, and what do you get for SL2? Well, here's my nilpotent F. It's E. You know, it, it's, you're already in SL2, so you don't have much to, choices on completing it. Um, is this matrix. And the slice is I take F, my base point, and I add to it things of the form zero lambda zero zero where lambda is a complex number. Okay, and so the previous um, construction uh, was a kind of Higgs bundle version of this slice where the coefficient here lambda wasn't a complex number, but it was some tensor depending on what type of bundle you were. Okay, and so what Hitchin did to prove his theorem is he kind of did this for a general, uh, I mean, prove his theorem for SLNR is he uh, generalize that construction to higher rank using this idea of this Slidovi slice. Okay, and the new objects I'll tell you a bit about today will be the same type of theme. Uh, you'll, uh, you'll, they'll arise from some Higgs bundle version of a Slidovi slice. Okay, so the idea Hitch of I parameterizing the space Hitchin described was um, I'm going to embed SL2C into a complex Lie group via some special embedding called the principal embedding. Um, and that's going to allow me to take my Higgs bundle version of type Miller space I told you about and think of it as a G Higgs bundle or GC Higgs bundle. And then the game is to do some sort of Slidovi slice for GC to construct these uh, components um, uh, for, these, for the other groups. So let me tell you how this works for SLNC. So for SLNC, the, the, this special embedding is just you consider how SL2 acts irreducibly on CN. Let me do it for SL3, so I don't have to write too many matrices or big matrices. So here's the nilpotent you consider. Here's F, this principal nilpotent or regular nilpotent. Here's E, the way you complete it to an SL2 triple. And what I wanna do is take the second symmetric product of my example Higgs bundle on the previous slide two slides. So when I do that, I get the rank three bundle, which is 
the holomorphic cotangent bundle plus the trivial bundle plus uh, the holomorphic tangent bundle. And the Higgs field phi is this matrix here, one and one here. So one now is a map from K to O twisted by K, and the other one is a one from O to K inverse twisted by K. Okay, so this is my base point, my F in the slice, and now I want to add to it uh, things in highest weight spaces. Okay, so I can add whoops, Q2 here, which is a holomorphic quadratic differential, as the maps go back. Um, and that's just the image of the whole SL2R thing I had before, but the point is there's more highest weight spaces now in SL3. The other one is spanned by the top right corner of the matrix, and that's a holomorphic cubic differential. So map from K inverse to K twisted by K. Okay, and this is an SL3R Higgs bundle. If you check, this bundle clearly has a natural orthogonal structure bearing the bundle of this dual, and this Higgs field is symmetric with respect to that of the Okay, so I've gotten something in the SL3R space, and what Hitch improved is, well, okay, you do this thing in SLNR, you know, you have lots of highest weight spaces, and the coefficients are holomorphic differentials of degree j from j equals 2 to n, and what Hitch improved is that this map from this vector space of holomorphic differentials into the SLNR modulus, Higgs bundle modulus space is injective open and closed. Um, and let's note that the Higgs field is not zero, right? Because of the ones. Yeah. So you can take all the differentials to be zero, that's fine, but now you have these ones. And so that means that the co associated representations are not you know, into compact sets. And in general, there's a general do it for a complex Lie group some vector space of holomorphic differentials whose degrees depend on the Lie group. These are the exponents of the group and they always land in this real subgroup called the split real form. Okay, so um, this component is now called the Hitchin component. Sorry, let me just do some subtraction, make sure I know what I'm supposed to end. Okay. Um, Good. So this component is now called the Hitchin component. Um, and maybe you're asking now, so I've told you kind of how its construction generalizes the Higgs bundle construction of type Miller space, but you know, type Miller space is a modular space of holomorph of geometric structures on the surface. So how, how much does this actually you know, deserve the name of a higher rank type Miller space? Um, so let me kind of just tell you that the answer is uh, it is a good name. I mean, it's a good, it does generalize various aspects of Teichner space, whether or not higher rank Teichner space is a good name or not, is a question I'll leave for a, a different uh, time. <laughs> um, so here's a theorem um, of Francois Laboury, which was also kind of had a component, uh, is a contribution to it uh, by a work of Falk and Gontrov. Um, um, so what, Francois proved is that uh, the Hitchin component consists entirely of representations which are discrete and fixed. Okay, so this is, of course, the much stronger result of not just not containing compact representations, that every representation in this whole kind of, so you know, somehow you have this Teichmuller space uh, subset, or this embedded copy of Teichmuller space, but now I've kind of deformed it as much as I could. And under all of those deformations, this property of the representations being discrete and faithful is preserved. Okay, and let me just note that Hitchens' result was in 91 and then Labrie's result was in 06. So a lot of time kind of went by between kind of handing uh, us the, kind of the place to look of like, here are these interesting representations and being able to actually understand their geometry. And of course, you know, so by down, of course, but what, this is a simplification of what, what these results are about. Um, the way uh, Lubbery proved this result is that he developed a much more general notion of uh, Anosov representations and um, showed that these Hitchin representations or the representations of this Hitchin component have this property and uh, a much stronger version of this property. I had to conclude if these things were closed. So, <laughs> Um, now let me just roughly tell you uh, what that property is. So here are some facts about what uh, the Lubbery 
um, did. So uh, let me just say he developed this notion of Anasov representations. So the, this is all I want you to take away from this is that as some facts, um, there's a class of representations called A, some subset of representations, and they're called Anasov. And they generalize many features of uh, representations uh, or of Fuchsian representations. Um, one property which is relevant for our discussion is that uh, representation in this set um, is automatically discrete. Okay, so that's, good. that's a property if you want. Um, two, these uh, generalized other aspects of you know, type of space, they're holonomies of certain geometric structures on uh, closed boundaries, uh, not the surface, uh, but other things. Um, and here's a big difference, though, for what we're looking for. This set is open in the character variety, which means, which is good. It means I can deform them and uh, remain um, having these nice properties. But in general, this condition is not a closed condition. And so, I mean, really, if you know what this is about, these are really generalizations of like quasi Fuchsian representations to higher rank uh, Lie groups or convex full compact representations, but uh, not Fuchsian representations. Um, and a key tool that is used to study them um, is a certain map from uh, the boundary of the fundamental group to a flag array. Okay, so you can kind of have this be in this set and uh, uh, elements in this set have certain parabolics which are special associated to them. Okay, so it is not open. Um, if it's not closed, sorry, uh, why, how should this be related to these higher rank type Miller spaces which I'm trying to tell you about? Um, well, these kitchen representations, you know, fall under this category, but they satisfy some additional properties um, which make them closed. Okay, and then there's been a lot of recent work um, trying to kind of put those general, those general prop, those extra properties into a general framework to identify what all the higher type of spaces, what the origin of them are. Okay, and now let me just briefly say what that is, and this is called positivity. So um, here's a kind of result of Guichard and Wienhard. Um, says that for a very special class of pairs, real Lie group, and parabolic subgroup. So this somehow there's a for, for these objects. Um, so not every real Lie group has such a parabolic, but you know it's really important that it's the it's not just the group, it's the how the group interacts with this flag variety. Um, generic triples of points in this flag variety admit a notion of being positive of a cyclic order. And this leads to this notion of, you know, an extra adjective you can put in front of an offset, anyway, positive an offset representation. Uh, let me briefly just say, you know, this boundary of the fundamental group is a circle. Triples of points there uh, have an orientation, positively oriented or negative from the orientation of the surface. And what this condition is, is insisting that these positive triples here go to positive triples. Okay, again, I'm not, I'm very aware that I'm not telling you what this property is. Um, but like the Anasa thing, it's open, and then the, the point is that this extra property is supposed to, uh, uh, is supposed to guarantee that the, this is also a closed set. And this is, you know, if you plug in the things which rise from Hitchin representations, uh, this is definitely, this is the case. Okay, so the goal is to generalize some positivity on the uh, full flag variety to other parabolics. Okay, let me just say, of course, now a conjecture of Guichard, Labrie, and Deanhardt is that these set of representations are closed, okay, that's I put there, and this is the source of all higher rank type of spaces. Okay, so slightly stronger and kind of uh, true in many cases and expected to be true in general, and kind of adapted to the language of the beginning of my talk, um, is that this set of positive Lanaza representations, well, is exactly the higher type rank type interspaces. And the complements of this set 
um, the components are all labeled by topological. Okay, so kind of more that not only are these higher rank type Miller spaces, but all the other ones aren't kind of, there are no other extra ones that pop up that you didn't know were there as a, from a topological. Okay, so kind of what I wanted you to take away here is that there is this kind of uh, conjectured uh, mechanism which kind of identifies higher rank Teichmuller spaces from the character variety side. Um, but can we kind of prove this conjecture using Higgs bonds? So maybe a possible strategy to uh, do this is to translate this notion of positivity into the language of Higgs bundles. Now this has it more tools, this moduli space, and can I then uh, use those extra tools to prove that these sets are closed? Um, and if that was uh, the case, I would have told you more about what the positivity actually was. And this is a this maybe shouldn't be surprised. This is a very this weights in part um, because well, if you want to bring a thing over to Higgs bundles, you need to solve a PDE. And how to translate, which, you know, we have, there exists a solution, but not, this is the solution. Um, and there was, a, you know, you, well, many properties of representations that somehow naive to think that it'll, you can just carry them over. Okay, so that's too hard. Um, so instead, what uh, we did, uh, which, uh, was we came up with a different Lie theory notion. We call these magical SL2 triples. And this is a Lie theory notion, which is adapted to the language of Higgs. Um, and so there are a few results. This is joint with Steve Bradlow, uh, Oscar Garcia Prada, Peter Gotten, and Andre Olivara. Um, one is a, just a Lie theory result. It's a classification of these objects, these magical SL2 triples. Important point is the set of uh, these objects is somehow the same classification as a set of P's and P groups and parabolics, which have this notion of positivity. Um, and then we do a Higgs bundle version of a slit OV slice um, for these very special SL2 triples um, and show that they contain these uh, special some representations which have this positivity. Okay, so it's not proving that they're closed, but it's kind of giving candidates using Higgs bundles um, to for, for the components per parameterized by this way. Okay, and then uh, using these results, recently uh, Guichard, Lavery, and Wienhardt were able to prove that the components that we've described using Higgs bundles uh, are indeed higher rank vector spaces. So that um, we have give some evidence where if, their conjecture uh, is true, you know, it, they would all be that case. Um, and they would, these components would all have be high rank type in their spaces. And they weren't able to quite prove the full strength of what they wanted, but they were able to uh, use some of the things we, some of the properties of the representations in these components um, and stuff that they know to conclude that, um, that all representations in these spaces are, are discrete. Okay, so um, let me tell you um, what this definition of this SL2, magical SL2 triple is. So let me maybe apologize for the name too. Uh, I'm not sure I'm in love with it, but uh, if you ever think about no potence of the Lie algebra, uh, of a complex Lie algebra, you realize that there's like 17 different special types of them, and they all have some name which has been taken. And magical is not one of them yet. So, <laughs> and uh, so that's really the. So really, they, maybe I should say they should be called positive, but uh, the the theorem can't be positive SL two triples correspond to positive things over here. Uh, yeah, okay, so that's the yeah. yeah that's somehow uh, the name should come after you prove that theorem. Okay. So uh, let me just tell you what this, this, this SL2 triple is because it's, the definition is pretty easy to get to and uh, it turns out to be the right thing um, for what we want. Okay, so uh, let's let G, C be a complex simple Lie algebra and F, H, and E be an SL2 triple inside. Okay, so this magical condition is gonna be a special condition on such an object. 
Um, okay, let's just use the same type of notation before. V is going to be the set of highest weight spaces, the kernel of add E. And I can break V into two pieces, the zero weight spaces for H. So this is the centralizer of the whole SL2 subalgebra, plus the set of positive uh, uh, highest weight spaces, a bunch of positive weights. Okay, and from this simple data, I can define for you a vector space involution of the Lie algebra, which should have been GC here, sorry. So how am I going to do it? I'm going to define it on the SL2. Uh, so I'm going to define it on F to be minus the identity. I'm going to define it on the V0, or the centralizer of the representation, to be plus the identity. And then I'm going to define it on the highest weight spaces to be minus, that are not zero to be minus the identity and lower it and on all the other ones uh, extended by bracketing with the lowering operator. So that means here on anything, if I take a vector in a uh, highest weight space and I apply add F to it J times, I do the involution, it should be minus one to the J plus one of, of that vector. Okay, so that's something you can do with any SL2 uh, representation um, on, as a vector space. Okay, but this play, this SL2 representation space E is more than a vector space, it's a Lie algebra. Uh, and this involution like intertwines the SL2 action, but not the whole V bracket. Okay, and the definition is that it's magical if this vector space involution is in fact a Lie algebra involution. Okay, so uh, in so Costin actually proved um, I think in 1954 that this principal SL2 inside of the complex A group, um, this type of involution is indeed a Lie algebra involution. Um, he didn't kind of use this language, but uh, it's kind of in there. And Hitchin really used those properties to um, prove certain things about you know, the, the Hitchin section for general reasons. And this is about the definition, which you can, which is the right one to uh, to be able to kind of generalize Hitchens construction of this slit OV slice to the, to uh, to these types of SL two triples, so that you get open and closed subsets when you do it. So let me the note that the key points of the construction are: if I have a magical triple, then I get a real form attached to it. Because I have an involution of the Lie algebra and I have anything like splitting into plus one and minus one eigenspaces. So I give a real form whose K plus KC plus PC decomposition is the plus one and minus one eigenspaces of the involution. And the way this is built is so that the place I'm going to add my highest, my coefficients, you know, like the holomorphic differentials I added in the principal case, um, that this guy somehow is the largest, its intersection with PC is as large as it can be. It's all in PC. And the trivial, the centralizer of the SL2 representation is in this KC thing. So these are things I can add to my Higgs field as you know, extra tensors. And here I can modify my bundle by this group. That's not the way that the construction works. And it's only for these types of things when you do this construction um, where you'll get uh, things in real Lie groups Higgs bundles in for real Lie groups, and uh, the parameterization gives you something of the right dimension. So, so here's the kind of technical theorem or the, the theorem with the, all the hypotheses. Um, says for each magical SL2 triple, uh, there's this, with the associated real form called G, there are components of the character variety which one contain positive representations somehow an indication that they are this higher type in the spaces. Um, they do not contain any compact representations analogous to the Hitch section. And we can prove this extra condition that the um, representations here are actually, you know, more than, not can, okay, they have this property that they don't factor through proper parabolic subgroups. There are singularities because I'm in a real group, but the, they always, Basically, we can prove the centralizer of these representations is always compact. Um, and okay, I say we construct this with 
of a Higgs bundle version of the Sladovi slice, generalizing what I told you about Hitchens construction. Um, maybe it's not appropriate for me to show you how that works. Uh, um, and then the theorem, which I alluded to before, was uh, by Guichard, Labri, and Greenhardt, is that properties one and three here, um, and more, you know, more information about positivity that um, that they know, um, imply that uh, these, all of the representations in this space are discrete. In particular, they are highly tight spaces. And uh, I'll just end by telling you, of course, I told you there was another theorem about classification. So, you know, it's important when you're talking about theorems that, you know, you're not talking about the empty set or what, uh, what Hitchin just did. So there are, there's a classification and I'll just tell you that there are four families of these things. There's the case, the first case, which is uh, the split real case. Um, that's the, the Hitchin uh, construction. There's another family uh, when the group is a Hermitian Lee group, so-called two type, two types, like S-U-N-N. Um, and then there are two other families. So there's S-O-P-Q um, for one less than P less than Q. And then there's these four exceptional Lee groups that are the quaternionic real forms of F-40, 60, 70, 80. So that picture on the first slide is uh, the, the magical no potent yeah, for this fourth uh, family in these set. Okay, and this is the same list as the positivity um, things. And I'll just, if you know about SL2s, I'll tell you where the SL2s are in this real thing. Um, okay, so that's it. Thanks for listening. Questions? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so there are a lot of representations that don't lie in the Hitchin component. Um, so in your previous slide, you had this theorem that suggests that says that the yeah the PE sub G contains positive representations. Then down below in these cases that there they are the type higher type of spaces on the nodes. Yeah. So where do these other lots of representations show up in the Higgs bundle? Picture? Ah, um, well, okay. One thing you can do is. So I, again, I didn't really show you how to do this slice construction for other SL2s, but if any SL2, uh, you know, will define for me an embedding of SL2R into my Lie group, and I can put type in the space in there, and I can do a similar type of construction, this Adobe slice thing. Um, but I, when I do that, and I want to say, oh, I'll just do it so I get representation to this real Lie group. Um, that'll be a closed set by the construction, but its dimension will be smaller than the, than the whole character book. So it'll be a closed set. Um, this is just a source of kind of this construction done where, you know, at least at the base point, you get an anasa. There are plenty of other anasa things which don't arise in this way, surely, but, uh, you know, identifying, I kind of the point I was trying to make at one point, the, is that identifying what Anasov representations are with Higgs bundles is not too hard. Um, except, you know, maybe there are some recent results uh, that are giving us more hints on how to do it in some special cases of variations of hard structure. But, so the crucial thing about the higher type model theory ones is positivity. Right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So here, uh, the way we prove uh, the contained positive representations is we have this SL2 locus, which is like the type Mueller space inside the character variety. And for those ones, you, you can kind of just look at them and see that they, they have this positive condition. So that's somehow at least one point there and it's open and uh, you can't see anything about it being closed. Okay, thanks. George and I have been thinking a lot about uh, um, SO2-1 um, mm -hmm. you know, and we, we, uh, the, the point here is, is that um, you you can do a lot of the things you can do in the case where you have a manifold quotient, just in the case where you replace, you know, which you, in fact, in that case, the first thing you do is uh, describe it as a Higgs right? And so what, what you're saying is, is that a lot of the things you can do that come from the 
uh, 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 proceeds being manifolds is uh, you go over to this other uh, and a more general context and you're constructing uh, uh, type more spaces for the representation, those representations, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I was, I was, uh, so, so anything you can do for the quotient, uh, quotient, uh, you can try to do for this, for this example, right? These examples, right? you can get many of the same type of theory. I think so. I don't know if I understood I it completely. Well, I'm not sure what my question is either, because I, I, I in other words, I'm saying it looks like an interesting thing about for us. But uh -huh. That's, uh, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, the, the other thing was, is for, this is all for dimension two. Yeah. Uh, does one ever get anything for, for higher dimensional? So, yeah, the, the, this story, like um, this, the story of Higgs bundles works on Taylor manifolds, uh, I see. What you mean, okay. uh, but, I mean. but the moduli space theory is just somehow in, is, is much more rigid. Uh, you don't uh, get moduli spaces where the dimension is the one you expect, which is in this case, the dimension of the spaces, which helps us prove openness is the dimension of the group times 2G minus 2. Um, and the dimension of the moduli space of Higgs bundles over a Taylor manifold uh, is, you know, it doesn't. It's usually not, you know, what you expect it from to be. And in addition, it's more complicated because um, there's an additional condition on the Higgs field to make it integrable. So you need to look at like the bracket of phi with itself and yeah, it's yeah. zero. There are no two zero forms. Somehow, I think that might be the you know the source of the extra complication. But, so I, you know, we generalize the fibers and stay on the, the base to, on the surface to, to go in any direction. Thank you. questions? So, so you said that most of representations correspond to some kind of geometric structures. Yeah. Can you say, I mean, is it, is it clear? Can you say one or two words about this? Well, yeah, so this is a result of Guichard and Bihar. Um, and that was kind of originally, and it's been, I mean, there's various generalizations of all this work uh, since their work, but um, I said the, one of the key things is to, is this boundary map here. So from this boundary map, um, one can build uh, a subspace in a different flag map, um, um, which is, uh, which they prove is a domain of discontinuity for the action of the group, and that the, comp that the quotient is compact. And so this domain is like the developing image of the developing map of this geometric structure. And there's a very concrete recipe of one how to, uh, what, you know, if I start with something into this thing, what the P is that you construct this geometric structure in, it turns out there's lots of them. In a very concrete case for SL3R, um, this is, you know, what, convex RP2 structures are that build open work. There your limit curve is in, um, well, you can think of it as living, there's one in RP2 and the image is uh, convex. And that's exactly the kind of image of the developing map for the convex RP2 structure um, for this representation. So, that's an answer. Thank you. Other questions? So, let me ask a really naive question. So this boundary of pi 1s, I, I know that as like some kind of Cantor set or Alfors David fractal. It, it, does this map, you just like define it on there and extend it to the circle? Uh, oh, well, for, for a closed surface, it's just the circle, right? It's just the uh, universal, uh, it's just the boundary of the hyperbolic plane of that. Oh, it's the boundary of that. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, but for you know a non-closed surface, or in general, you can put a, a hyperbolic group here and you look at its chromoff boundary. You know this this theory is adapted to looking at representations of hyperbolic groups, and you know then you have to deal with these issues. And I'm not the right person to ask about okay. the details. Thank you. Any no more questions? Let's thank. <laughs>